Well, joining me now to take a look at the week in federal politics are three colleagues from the Parliamentary Press Gallery. Bob Fife is the Ottawa Bureau Chief for the Globe and Mail. Catherine Lévesque is a parliamentary reporter for La Presse. And Susan Delacourt is a columnist for the Toronto Star. All three of you are welcome. Thanks for coming in. Thank you. Thank you. Let's start with the meetings that were going on. Before we even got the cameras rolling, we were saying that the, the mood and the, the tone right now is a bit different from about a week ago or even the beginning of this week because we do have ongoing meetings now in Smithers, B.C. between uh, federal and provincial ministers and the, the uh, Wet'suwet'en hereditary chiefs. Let's start with that. What do you make of where it's going from here? We'll start with you, Bob. Well, it doesn't seem to be going anywhere. Uh, this has been, uh, we're heading into our fourth week now and there hasn't been a resolution of this. And the hereditary chiefs, the five hereditary chiefs, do not seem to be showing any willingness to compromise. Even though the majority of the people uh, on the Wet'suwet'en lands want the, the pipeline, the majority of the hereditary chiefs, including the matriarchs, want it because they want jobs for their people and economic opportunities. But it does not look like uh, at, the, at, at least this stage, that there's uh, an avenue for a resolution of this. And we could be sitting here and when the first ministers meet in a couple of weeks' time with this issue still before the country. So notwithstanding the smiles and the claims of progress that they're actually now finally sitting down and they're, having, they're starting to lay out a framework for, for meetings, Catherine? That's just the start of something. Is it yeah. the start of the resolution? I'm not sure because this is not just about the pipeline anymore. This is about reconciliation. This is a much bigger subject now that we're talking about. And I'm, I don't think they're, gonna, they're going to be done as of today. I think this is going to go on for during the weekend. And we've yeah. been all week holding our breath, trying to see what will happen as of now, but I don't think there's going to be a clear resolution. I mean, but the, you know, in some way they'll have to come with the resolution, but I'm not sure what that is going to be. I don't know if that's going to be acceptable, and I don't know whether or not the chiefs are going to, uh, you know, ask the the last blockade right now is in Kanawake to stop. So we'll mm. we'll try to see what happens during the weekend, but as of right now, we don't have any indication. The, okay, Susan, the preparation. I mean, what we've been told is that this is in preparation for you know setting up a framework for future discussion and eventually a meeting with the Prime Minister and Prime Minister and Premier Horgan. Yeah, uh, before, uh, between last week, as you mentioned, and this week, it got worse, mm -hmm. you know, and I've been struck by the Indigenous voices, as Bob was referring to, um, the, the, the people within their own community who are saying, this is not helping. Yeah. Um, and the poll numbers showing that support for reconciliation, while Canadians may support it notionally, uh, this has done a lot of damage. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've been saying this since the beginning, it's not just the damage to the government, it's the damage to the idea of Indigenous reconciliation in this country. And I think if cooler heads do prevail in some way, and the incentive to for cooler heads doesn't seem to exist yet, um, but if cooler heads prevail, maybe they can get this back on track, yeah. pardon the pun. I mean, but, look what would happen if if five hereditary chiefs said, we support the pipeline, mm -hmm. but the majority hereditary chiefs and the majority of the band said, yeah. no, we're against this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, guess what all these people would be doing? They'd be, uh, the radical, and uh, I mean, I'm talking about some anarchists and anti-capitalists who seem to have glommed onto this for their own reasons. Mm -hmm. Uh, because they oppose pipelines, they would be they would be siding with the majority and saying hereditary chiefs don't count. But the, the, we have a, a big problem here, and, and Susan's nailed it. I mean, they are doing irreparable harm to uh, Canadians. Do want a, a process of reconciliation with First Nations? But if your if your jobs are being threatened, you can't get to work. They're holding up go trains, and, and you're holding up good work pipelines, that is not a solution. I guess so that still then poses a question. We saw, for example, yesterday that they let, at the beginning of the meetings, they let some of the pipeline supporters in, uh, some of the matriarchs and some of the, the, the local uh, First Nation members were allowed in to have their say. The question is, though, you're, you're Prime Minister Trudeau, you are Carolyn Bennett, you are having these discussions. The hereditary chiefs seem to be fairly adamant that they don't want it across their territory. Uh, they want either no pipeline or a complete change in, in the trajectory. What does the Prime Minister do? Is there a serious plan for him to be meeting with them, or is that just a non-starter? Oh, well, uh, he, you, you, you do want to be careful of not elevating this to yeah. a matter of a national leader 
talking to, and especially with the divisions within. Yeah. Um, so I, th I think one does want to be careful. And, and John Horgan, the Premier, has been speaking up about that too. They've been demanding that Horgan meet with them as well. But they have to avoid being seen to get into the middle of that dispute between the hereditary chiefs yeah. and the the other ones. So I, I think the groundwork does have to be laid. Uh, Trudeau is in a very difficult position, though. Yeah. He is trying to play the middle, and the middle is a very hard place to play in. Katrine, you were mentioning Ganawake as well. I mean, Ganawake, we still have one outstanding, uh, outstanding yes. blockade in Ganawake. Uh, they're interesting development this week because you have the, pr the Premier of Quebec, Francois Legault, saying he wants action on it. The Sûreté de Quebec has said, no, we're not going to go in if the peacekeepers are not going to intervene for us. There's a long history there. Where does that go? Well, I think it's interesting because uh, what Premier Legault said this week was a counterexample of, well, it's an example of what not to do because yeah. he was one of the first uh, premiers to say, hey, the police has to intervene, something has to be done. And now the last blockade is in Quebec and yeah. he's justifying the fact that uh, the Sûreté du Québec can't access the territory and he's blaming it on illegal guns. So basically this is not helping the conversation right now. It, yeah. It's just reinforcing also, I think, racism I mean, against Indigenous peoples and that's kind of what we see in Quebec yeah. right now. So that that's, I mean, it's very divisive language, it's very dangerous, mm -hmm. but also proves the fact, well, maybe proves a point to the Trudeau government that maybe, yeah, we, we should just tone things down, hope to, you know, get a resolution somehow, but Premier, I mean, definitely in Quebec, this is not a good situation. As Susan mentions, though, I mean, if, if uh, as you've all mentioned, if reconciliation is being so sorely tested by the situation, by this very, very intractable disagreement on what's so in territory, the Prime Minister's popularity is going down. Uh, the polling is showing. Well, it. he's going down because he hasn't been doing very much. He was, when this first started, he was in Africa, had very little to say. Yeah. He came back and said it was a provincial responsibility, he washed his hands of it. And then he started, when the Conservatives started getting on him, although they used language that was probably a little too over the top, uh, he said, oh, we want dialogue, we want dialogue, we're not going to, we don't need to have, to have the police involved. Yeah. And next thing you know, uh, by the Thursday or the Friday, he was saying, well, can't do this anymore. We, and the police did start to act. I think probably, I, I think people will see weakness in the Prime Minister, and I think if, if they had acted earlier, in arresting, not, talk, not, not talking about indigenous people, but starting to arrest some of these protesters who are holding up the, the trains, yeah. um, we, we might not have been in the situation we are in. And in all of this, in about two weeks' time, we have a First Minister's Conference. Uh, announced yesterday on the 13th of March, Friday the 13th, what could go wrong, um, and with a meeting of the major Aboriginal groups on the 12th, on Thursday night, uh, in the middle of March. So you have that meeting coming up. Uh, where does that figure into things? Well, I, you know, not so long ago, we thought that was going to be the hardest thing that happened to Trudeau this year with yeah. the First Ministers. It was originally supposed to happen the first week of February, yeah. and it's been put off and put off and put off. I think not just for these reasons, but um, it definitely is the second ring or maybe the seventh ring in a many ring circus that is yeah. going on right now. I thought you were going to say the many rings of hell, Dante's yeah, Inferno. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I bet you it feels like that way inside <laughs> government. Um, so I'm curious to see whether um, it's the old issues from last fall that dominate this First Minister's Conference or whether events have taken over mm. as well because certainly the dialogue between Jason Kenney and the Prime Minister has moved a long way for good or for ill since yeah. after the election. There have been some moments of rapprochement and there have been some tech mine, yeah. um, you know, uh, has, has thrown them apart too. But uh, I, I don't know exactly why, I think it's obvious, but that the Indigenous meeting was first um, mm -hmm. yeah. and then the Premier's that tells you that whatever has been going on this past two months is setting the stage for that meeting, unlike the election setting the stage mm -hmm. for it. Catherine, what will you be watching for in that first meeting? I mean, I know it's a while off yet, but... Yeah, no, it's, it's in two weeks, but still, I asked the PMO, what are they expecting to be working on? And the answer I got was, we will focus on the economy and clean growth. And I thought the wording was quite interesting because we're certainly, we're going to be talking about uh, big projects happening yeah. in Canada 
can they still happen? And, you know, what's the path forward? And certainly, uh, prime ministers from provinces will have a lot of questions on this. Yeah. And so just the fact that we're wording this, like, clean growth, I mean, mm -hmm. I think it's kind of sets the stage that, well, big polluting projects can't happen anymore. So that's the feeling I get. And yeah. I think it's go there's going to be a lot of lively discussions over there. Mm -hmm. Well, they're trying to set the table for the budget that's going to happen later in the month. Yeah. Uh, that's for sure. But one of the things that they this government needs to do, um, they need to get moving a lot quicker on what their <laughs> climate change strategy is yeah. so Canadian businesses can know where they can invest or what they have to undertake. And they also have to, because Jason Kenney's been irresponsible, he's been throwing all kinds of firebombs at the federal government, he has a responsibility too, as we heard from the tech resources, they want both Alberta and Saskatchewan and the federal government to sit down at the table and to get some reasonable climate change strategy that will allow investment in our very important resources. At the same time, we have to be serious about dealing with uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And there doesn't seem to be any willingness on the part of Mr. Kenny uh, to do that. And, he, you know, he's got to put some water in his wine as well. Mm -hmm. The thinking is, too, I mean, the other piece of, it, of the agenda, which was put off uh, after Christmas, and that is a fiscal stabilization program, much wanted by the provinces. They well, want they'll that get that in the budget. That'll come in the budget. Yeah. Yeah. So this will be a chance maybe to promise it at the uh, Premier's meeting. I, I think, yeah, they, they had said, uh, I, I think it was a month ago, it's hard to measure time these days, but I think about a month ago they said there would be nothing on fiscal yeah. stabilization at the Premier's meeting, so... Wait for the budget. Right. Wait for the budget, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, last question. Uh, we have seven candidates and potentially another two to be confirmed in the Conservative leadership race. Reactions, just briefly, now that we know them all? It's the B team. I mean, <laughs> certainly, <laughs> no. <laughs> well, I, it's, it's true. I mean, there's Peter McKay, sure, but and all the other front runners, you know, the big names we were hoping for, are not running this time around. Yeah. And we essentially have a, quite a big field of candidates, but I mean, they're. A lot of people don't know who these people are, and these are people who just want to be noticed. Also, me worth mentioning that these people are not confirmed official candidates yet because yeah. they, they still have to give the uh, $300,000. Uh, yeah. so, Except um, for Peter McKay, who's made all of the payments yes, and done everything. Yes, Erno exactly. yeah. is, yep. is on his way as well. So, um, yeah, I think it's going to be a crowded field, and I think where there's not going to be a lot of debate, there's a lot of consensus. Campaign pro-life and the social conservative groups have a lot of candidates that they are touting for. Uh, several of the, the uh, yeah, I guess we could say less popular or less well-known names, there's at least three to four candidates who are getting the, the, getting the nod from the campaign. How's that affecting the major candidates? Well, go ahead. Uh, well, I, I was struck by the role of those groups in the last leadership race, yep. and we saw how that turned out. Um, Bob and I would have long enough memories to remember when parties are weak, um, single interest issue, a single interest, single issue, um, groups like this yeah. tend to see parties as a place for a ripe for takeover. Um, I would see the fact that they are continuing their influence in the Conservative Party as a sign that the party, its fundraising may be strong, but the party organization is weak. Mm -hmm. This is not a vote getter for the Conservative Party to, say the least. to be uh, <laughs> with uh, pro life groups and giving them such a stage which they will get at the convention. Mm -hmm. And people are going to walk away saying, uh oh, they haven't learned their lesson yet. And, you know, that was one of the reasons why Mr. Uh, Mr. Scheer, because the pro life, but also the homophobic stuff, um, lost the election campaign, climate change as well. But that mm -hmm. clearly was an issue for them. And I, I, it's, it's it, not, it doesn't help them. Yeah. It's one of the reasons he won the, the, yep. the, the, the leadership. Of and he lost the election, and that's because two different contests. Mm -hmm. And we, you want women voters and you young, <laughs> young voters. Mm -hmm. You have yeah. to expand your base if you want to win. Yeah, and, and urban voters. I mean, yeah. 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 they have to, yeah, that, that was their goal. That's what exactly what they said just after the election. Now we are here, <laughs> talking about abortion again. Well, we've got a few months still to talk about the, the conservative uh, leadership race. I want to thank uh, all three of you for coming in. Thank you. Thank you.